So I was, so I uh, planned this as a conversation on translation because Itanjali has given innumerable interviews and everything that can be said about the novel and about her literary influences uh, and so on has been said. You can, uh, you can read uh, what she has to say on those things. So I thought I'd just ask two questions around translation and then open it up to you because you've also come to talk to Gitanji, who has been touched by JNU. Uh, so, uh, Gitanji, my um, first, so I thought my first question to you could be to you as a writer whose work has been translated. And my second question, which I will ask after you have addressed this, is about uh, yourself as a reader, because you obviously read World literature and translation. So I have a question about how you read translations. So um, now, uh, Gitanji said something very interesting uh, in an earlier interview, which was at the end of Kali Jaga, on attempting to translate her own work, which is very interesting because she's completely, as I said, by her uh, thesis is in um, uh, is in English, and she could as well have translated. Uh, her own work. So she was asked this question about whether you have tried to translate. Okay, I will. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, she was asked, um, did you ever attempt to translate your own work? And she did start off trying to translate Hari Jaga by herself. So this was her answer, and it's a very complex answer. And I thought we could. I would just ask you a question coming out of that. So she said, in response to that, that the act of creation is in itself a kind of translation from an amorphous language in the mind to words in a recognized language. To translate that again into yet another language meant a double translation. Especially in my kind of writing, which is to begin with writing in an invented Hindi, to search out next an invented English was not easy. To be adventurous and idiosyncratic in two languages, in one with Hindi at the center and English play with it, in the other these languages in a reverse relationship was not easy. Also the Hindi original had lines from Bollywood songs and Urdu poetry which I wrote and read in their original cadences. A straight translation made the lines trite and banished melody and poetry from them. A translator adept at playing in an invented English was therefore required. I, I found this uh, really, it's, it's very rare for a writer to, uh, to uh, have such a deep sense of the levels at which uh, she's working because writing is also such a spontaneous act at some level. So for her to be so reflective about the whole process, I found that very interesting. So I thought uh, you could maybe tell us something about your experiences with your own, with the translations of your work, and uh, how does it feel to see your own words that have been chewed over and uh, thought about, you know, so it's, you know, it's, it's your life blood, and to see it in different forms uh, in, in English, which you do know and read, of course, you may not have access to the other languages in which they are translated. But um, do you uh, do you find them alien? Is that sudden unfamiliarity with your own words productive in some way? So how do you relate to the translations of your own words? Where am I speaking to much more in your blood, much more, you know, with 
do from, I mean, it sounds a bit um, glorified, but it's like with you, it's a prenatal kind of connection that you have with the language. And I think I discovered I had that with Hindi, and I've worked on uh, it so much over the years to uh, get that to resurface from wherever it had gone and buried itself because of our history, because of our upbringing. So after that, I don't think I really had one the time to do something similar with English. I'm sure something interesting would come out if I tried and went on that journey. But also, I felt that perhaps you know there was a tone here and there were there were registers here which I wouldn't get. In English. So I'm just adding to that. Translation, yes, of course, I think everything is a translation. We're always translating. And what is the... Uh, to, to my work being translated, I think um, I'm not a very uh, fussy writer in that sense. Do you agree or you don't? <laughs> I am fussy. Healthily <laughs> <Henry> fussy. <laughs> okay. No, but I think I think one should be a little fussy. Okay. Yes. But, no, but but I think there is uh, you know and I'm not obsessed in a way I hear a lot of writers are about uh, you know whether I mean for instance just to give an example uh, an uh, example that comes immediately to mind. I mean Hindi it's called Red Samadhi and they chose tomb of sand and I had a problem with that because I thought tomb was not um, doing justice at all to the word samadhi. And I spoke of that, and we had um, lots of, you know, we talked about it, debated about it. What was your own preference? I said, use the word samadhi. The, the French actually uses the word samadhi, and it's there in the dictionary. And translation, anyway, is, you know, not uh, something static. It is always, you know, extending the vocabulary. So why not use a word which will gradually then become, you know, accepted in another um, cultural medium? So I, I actually wanted the word samadhi to be retained, but uh, the worry of the publisher was that if, uh, you know when people walk into a shop and see samadhi, you know they going to th they have this picture of something exotic from the Orient and things, and they didn't want to do that. They wanted it to. They didn't know, of course, that the book was going to be uh, for the booker, because if it was going to get the booker, then it didn't matter what the name was. <laughs> 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 I think the least of the worries. But at that point, it was like any other book, and they were worried about it looking, you know, sort of, sort of, sort of, very sort of rare and exotic, and they wanted it to look like any other book. So I, I gave it, and uh, so I'm just saying that there is a certain detachment I would have that okay, there comes a point after which you know better, and I'll leave it to you. Up to that point, I would, you know, I will talk about it and I'll try and sort of. Sometimes I have to myself think what I meant. So that's the other thing. Working with translators, it means having really to, um, you know, to bring into the conscious things which you have actually been uh, working more intuitively. And I don't mean by intuition, you know, something uh, which is kind of uh, nothing to do with intelligence. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an intuition which has been honed over the years, and it's full of many, many things. And uh, you know, knowledge, imagination, observation, tradition, everything. But I, I work without really sitting and thinking of every word, where it's coming from, every context, where it's coming from. And suddenly, when I'm talking to the translators and you know, dealing with their questions, I have to sit and figure out where it's all coming from. So it becomes like, so it becomes a different kind of research that one has to do into one's own self. So that, uh, <coughs> that was, I mean, I found it very fascinating, very um, excruciating also, and um, it took us a long time. I think you and I also, I mean, we had the advantage of being in, uh, at least in physical proximity, we were in the same neighborhood, so it uh, made it uh, relatively simpler. In the case of Annie Monto, my French translator, and uh, Daisy Rockwell, who I'd never met till the, you know, the Booker event. Yeah. So we never met, so we were just, uh, you know, emailing each other and there was, I mean, I think uh, there'll be uh, a book um, at least double the size of the emails that we have <laughs> <laughs> uh, So we, there we were, you know, talking about everything. But believe it or not, I talked about everything, we discussed as many things as she wanted to and I had uh, my opinion about everything, I agreed, disagreed, 
and we ironed it out or we agreed to disagree, etc. But once the book came out, I haven't read it. So this is, today is the first time that I've read the border piece. So I just haven't read to see how it's all coming together. Now that's a kind of defense mechanism also. Because, I mean, there are, there are things, you know, um, basically a certain cadences, which I think will be different, and um, I'm not going to feel very pleased with that. What I'm willing to concede is that there are so many people in the world who are responding to that sure. and responding to it positively and so I'm very happy. I mean, who am I? Forget me. The author's dead. Absolutely. And there are people, I mean, uh, people who, have, who don't know, even India, people who don't know, like the book uh, jury, I mean, they're reading uh, things from everywhere and they are responding, they responded so um, so intensely, so deeply and in such detail to this book. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, I'm just amazed and I've said this before, but I, you know, I looked with some awe at the book and thought, my God, what is this, you know, how, what, what is it there? I mean, it's a curi I'm curious, I can't sort of read it from the, uh, I can't read it with their eyes. And I wonder what is, did they enjoy this? Did they enjoy that? What was it that they were really enjoying? So it's wonderful. I mean, it's like you, you, you are uh, nowhere there. You know, it's something else now, and people are people seem to be liking it. So I'm very happy to let go. So that is how I think my relationship with my translators has been. That when we are working, we are deeply engaged with each, with each other as well. But after that, I let it be. such a lovely account of the relationship between the writer and the translator and uh, yeah I, I really enjoyed listening to that and I really my second question will actually almost follow up from what uh, you said about how you wanted the title to have the word Samadhi and um, it's an interesting thought experiment that had the booker been known first then the title wouldn't have mattered but the title did matter for it to be taken seriously by the booker, perhaps. So I was actually thinking about the fact that all of us in this room read a lot of literature and translation. We're not thinking about the translator at all. We're reading it as if it were written in English, whether it is Foucault and Marx, or whether it is fiction or poetry. Uh, we're reading in translation from different Indian languages, from different foreign languages and we are not really addressing or thinking about the fact that this was not written in English. We are not thinking about that all the time. We just read it and say what a great story, what a beautiful way of putting that border thing and uh, the translator lies kind of disguised there somewhere. So I was actually, I've been, uh, I remember sharing with you when we were working on this, why I said She's fussy, is bigger, and that's actually when she explained it at the end. The process is very intense. She can land up at your place. Daisy Rockwell only got an email at 7 a.m. <laughs> I live close enough to her for her to be ringing the bell at 7 a.m. to say whatever it is that she had to say, which could go on till 11. And we were like tensely, you know, guarding the borders of uh, our words. Uh, <laughs> so she's. So I meant fussy in that sense, in a good sense. I mean, she's very connected, but I, I like what she said that once it's done, she lets it go. So I remember that, that during that time, I was um, sharing with her a very interesting blog post I had come across, uh, a blog post on translation by, I'm not going to be pronouncing this correctly, so those who understand Spanish will have to forgive me. I think it's Angel Guria Quintana, in which he compares translations of Oran Pamuk's Black Book, but, so there are two translations of Oran Pamuk's Black Book into English, one by a Turkish writer called Guneli Gun, and later by Maureen Freely. The Maureen Freely's translations are the ones we really know. Maureen Freely's translations are the ones that got Pamuk the Nobel. Uh, so Kintana, what he does is he compares the two translations, and he says that the Gun translation was thought of 
as faithful to Turkish conventions of writing and therefore not in the contemporary style of writing English. While Freely, who was the later translator, then translated Pamuk into contemporary English as it emerges from the Anglo-American world. So what he does in that blog post uh, is he first gives the first sentence in Turkish, so the first sentence of the novel, in Turkish just word by word, which of course I, I won't uh, read that to you, it's just the way it's written, you know, wo waha gaya, he there went, that sort of thing, he just puts the words in order. And then he gives us the translations of that first sentence by Guneri Gun, who is supposed to be not able to be contemporary enough in terms of contemporary English usage, and then Molly Freely. So this is Guneri Gun's translation of the first sentence of the Black Book. Ruya slept on her stomach in the sweet and warm darkness under the blue checkered quilt which covered the entire bed with its undulating shadowy valleys and soft blue hills. This has been rendered by Freely into crispy, much more sharp. Ruya was lying face down on the bed, lost to the sweet warm darkness beneath the billowing folds of the blue checked quilt. So, uh, I think this goes beyond the age-old debate in uh, translation studies on faithfulness to the original language versus clarity in the target language. It speaks to systems of power even within the Anglophone world, which now goes far beyond Anglo-America. So, have you, have you thought about this? I mean, uh, for, for, the, for example, the difference between the two translations, I related much more Affectionately, affectionately and emotionally to Guneri Gun's translation. Uh, it was more the way in which Hindi is written in the Turkish part. Yeah, the Turkish, the Turkish, uh, both are in English, but the yeah. Turkish author translated it in a more, in a way that I could relate to more because it's the way Hindi, Urdu, dialogues, there's a kind of roundity, you know. Uh, Maureen Fili made it standard contemporary American English, uh, which is, I thought not, it's my personal feeling that the first one will I related to better. So there, there are obviously levels of power even within the Anglophone world. So I was wondering if you've thought about that in the course of your own reading of translations. Did you have any thoughts on this? And then after Gitanjali speaks for as long as she wants to on this, we'll open it up to you. Would you talk about just of translations in general, not particularly mine? No, now these are about how you read. <coughs> well, again, a uh, rambling answer. The two things I'm thinking of. See, uh, I think each language definitely has its own uh, uh, personality coming from its, uh, you know, the, the cultural uh, sort of, uh, milieu from which. <laughs> okay. So, uh, this, this thing about Turkish being is convoluted, roundabout, flowery, style, and possibly Indian languages having a lot of that. It's definitely there. English being a kind of crisp, um, you know, much more accessible uh, language is probably also there. But, uh, um, I, mean, I mean, I was thinking that Red Samadhi translated into an Indian language would in some sense uh, be easier, you know, much closer to in, in its tonality to the original than the English. But, but having said that, I think we are living in times when uh, borders have really collapsed between languages like never before. And I think each, uh, there, there is almost no standardized, um, you know, language within any language anymore. So what is English? I mean, English and English and English and English. So I think I don't know what one would try, how one would try to make it standardized English anymore. I think there is scope today for a lot more eclectic sounding, strange sounding, um, a new kind of mix, invented uh, language style in uh, translations than ever before. 
So I, I don't think it worries me. Uh, I, I don't think it's, the question has the same kind of uh, implications as it did the time we were reading Russian literature, for instance. So I think we, we, we are living in very different times. And today, I mean, um, at some level, I know that it's been said about Great Samadhi and Tuno San that uh, Daisy Rockwell has made it much more accessible, that she's clarified it much more, while mine is slightly more confounding. Somebody said it, I don't know whether in praise or in a slight criticism, that there's a certain fever in mine, and she's brought it to a more even temperature. <laughs> so, now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I would wonder. Because I, I, what, what I think, I mean, the, one of the best things about literature is that it confounds. It's not there to clarify. But then let's not carry either of these things to such ridiculous um, you know, extents that we make them both uh, sort of absurd and we kind of uh, reduce uh, the, um, <coughs> the worth of what we are saying. So, um, so, I know, so I know that even here it's been said, but will not permit a translator to put it into standardized any language. They just cannot do it. Even a Daisy Rockwell cannot do it. Even if she's made it more accessible, she has to make it, you know, playful, inventive, adventurous, another kind of eclectic something. So I think uh, today we are in a position where translations uh, don't have to pretend anymore to be original in the language. You know, I don't think they have that pressure anymore. They can actually, uh, they don't have to be, you know, sort of um, wood plated with gold, pretending to be gold. You know, they, can, they can be what they are. They are wood. So if they are wood, they are wood. If they are translation, they are translation. There is something else which is important. Some kind of energy, some kind of unity, some kind of, you know, it having found its personality and feet and, uh, you know, um, it's um, entity, having become a strong entity in its own right. If it's done that, with all these other things happening, with, with it looking still like the translation, I think I have no problem and I think there is this possibility today. Sorry, garbled. No, no, and please there take is. the mic now because uh, you're going to be, yes, we'll just take a few questions. Yes. I have one.